Nice to see you again. Um, so, Gishet, do you want to say something about CAPTCHA query as an introduction or? If you would like me to, I won't miss the opportunity to flag off this first uh, session. Is Sam in now, Vikram? Um, or we're waiting for uh, him to join? Nishi, Sam will join a little later so we can continue. But Julian is already there. All right. OK, so uh, I can start or Shivita, you can tell us, you know, if you want us to introduce ourselves or whatever the flow. I mean, you can establish the ground rules. I can speak when you want me to. Uh, OK, uh, probably you can um, start about Capgemini and I uh, will give a small welcome note and then I can introduce the speakers and they can start with the sessions. Yeah, of course, of course. OK, good. So thank you so much, uh, everybody for this meeting. Um, you know, really honored to you know receive this time and it always happens, you know, and so and particularly when I'm uh, meeting with students and faculty uh, and on this occasion it's IASC, so even more. And, and also because, you know, the topic that we have today, right, where we believe this particular technology is going to shape the future in, in ways that will help us unhinge from what we today know as binary construct of computing, correct? And uh, many, many moons ago, right, when I was in IIT, um, we used to have corporate leaders visit us and address uh, us sometimes. And I can't tell you how, you know, those each of those sessions, in fact, you know, have made their mark on what and where I am today. Uh, you see, uh, also pronounced because, you know, we didn't have mobile phones or even landline, you know, in most of uh, Indian homes in the early 90s. And, and you know, these moments of uh, corporate and academia connect uh, were a great privilege uh, you know, to us as students um, because you know these industry leaders used to travel frequently okay in trains in fact from across India to be with us and just as a uh, you know to set the tone uh, Infosys was barely a couple of thousand employees you know in those days just under 20 25 million or so in revenues and I, in 93 when they listed uh, on the Nasdaq right it was at a princely sum of 145 rupees okay uh, per share so yeah, that's my vintage, although many of you might uh, make the mistake of thinking I'm your age group. Uh, but, uh, you know, today is such a different world, right? I'm joined by my colleagues from across the world to meet with you all, right? Uh, all of you from wherever yeah, across the country. Um, and, you know, and every time I meet with you young students particularly, right, I feel this incredible surge of uh, energy gushing through my veins. And quite frankly, I find that I take back a lot you know, with me from these sessions. So, so thank you so much for your collective energy because your dreams are what power the future for most of us. Um, so our session today is hopefully the first of many more uh, types of engagements that will follow. Um, from seminar today to joint research to global internships, etc. And of course, you know, um, I'll be working with the, you know, many of you as we go along. So. I shan't come in front of you and the main speakers of today, so let me hand this back to Sri um, you know, and uh, you can, you know, take it on from here. But thank you so much for having me for this session. Okay, uh, let me welcome the members from Kapjaviri formally, and uh, let me tell the students who are actually the focus of today's audience that Capgemini is a multinational company focusing on IT services and they have identified quantum technology as an important area for future. They have also set up a center in Bangalore which will work on this area and they are very much interested in having students from IISC as interns um, in the uh, future program. So that is the aim of this workshop. They want to introduce the type of work they do and the uh, focus uh, topics on which uh, they are going to uh, develop uh, various things for the future and today in that direction there will be two talks one is on quantum finance 
and uh, other is on uh, drug development so uh, dr julian who is uh, here he is going to speak on quantum finance and then dr sam ganwe will talk about uh, drug development so i will uh, uh, give it over to shri vidya to say a few words about our center in iisc what we have started and uh, what we plan to do okay shri vidya thank you professor apurva so let me quickly share the screen i hope my screen is visible yeah my screen is visible right it is it is it's visible okay. it's visible shivam ji sorry i didn't Thanks. realize when you do a full <laughs> screen share you can't see us gesticulating yeah yeah you're, yes. you're audible yeah okay uh so many thanks uh, for being a part of this uh, seminar so to give a brief about iisc quantum technology initiative let me just quickly go through about iisc i this is the main building of iisc which is a, more than a century old we have about six divisions comprising of 44 departments and we rank first in the nerf ranking and these are some statistics uh coming to iqta consortium it is built upon by 40 faculties from 11 departments they all range from basic science to engineering and computer science division departments and the vision of this consortium is to have a to promote collaboration between physics material science and computer science and engineers towards applications and fundamental studies on quantum technologies so this is a kind of a collage of these faculties who are in the part of this consortium and this iqta was actually instituted just um, probably one 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 and a half years before in september 2020 with 40 faculties from 11 departments one of the major in order to promote quantum technologies one aspect that we took is the because of covid situations is the virtual media where we had this iisc Uh, quant talks now we are almost done with 15 quant talks it's uh, in a month we do uh, we host two quant talks uh, from people from across the nation as well as, well as worldwide and the other milestone is that we started we we were fortunate enough to start the mtech program in quantum technology which has already commenced in august 2021 semester and i hope all the students the first batch of students are here in this seminar this consortium we also leverage to submit many collaborative proposals as quantum technology is it's an amalgamation of various disciplines of science we try to foster collaborations between different uh, departments different institutes uh, national and international and we hope this would lead to build capacities in quantum technology domain to just to give a brief about the topics that we uh, the faculties in this consortium we uh, work on uh, this is the few topics uh, which i could mention on core quantum technology and then theory we all there are faculties who work on theoretical and modeling support like quantum cryptography communications algorithms and then there are other peripheral technology and engineering which is required for the a uh, complete development of uh, devices and things uh this is an example of how things work here uh, this is a multi sponsored project on phot photonic integrated circuit where you can see people from various divisions like engineering computer science physics come together to solve a single problem uh this is just a brief about an mtech program in quantum technology uh which is a two year program uh, which almost covers the thrust areas that is there in quantum technology and these are the few support that we have received for the mtech program in terms of uh, laboratory equipment and computational resources and this is just a glimpse of the talk that we have posted and the repository that we maintain in the in our iqti uh, youtube channel so with this uh, let me 
thank uh, for the patience and probably we can start with the session. So, uh, Julian, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. Or is, okay. Good. Yeah, so Sam, uh, Sam will join a bit later. So, uh, so I'll, I'll start. Okay, fine. Then probably I'll give a quick introduction and then you can start. Okay. Thank you yeah. so much. So, uh, uh, we will start with the session two. Uh, first, uh, so Julian is the CTIO and the head of the Camtini in Quantum Lab uh, at Capgemini. So he has a background in quantum matter physics. At Capgemini, he's the one who has initiated the quantum group and has helped many clients uh, to increase their quantum readiness. And today he will talk about quantum computing in finance. Over to you, Julian. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So. Um... Yeah, so what I will talk about today is to uh, to give you a bit of understanding of the things that we want to do and that we are doing with uh, with our clients. Um, uh, most of my tech, most of my presentation, I kept relatively technical uh, because I think uh, I thought uh, you guys would like that. Uh, but uh, uh, please interrupt me uh, if, if if I go too fast. Um, so um, so for a, a few words about about the state. Uh, of quantum technology and uh, and the Capgemini Quantum Lab is that you know this is really an, a time where um, where many of many clients are starting to experimenting with quantum technology, even though quantum technology is still realistically maybe five, ten, fifteen years away, right? So it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely no one has had a um, uh, a use case in production that's actually doing something useful. That being said, you know it it is so disruptful. It can it can really speed things up millions of times, uh, and it can have such a big impact in so many industries in finance, life sciences, automotive, aerospace, you name it. Um, that it's really a good idea to start uh, to start exploring. Um, but it, it, you have to acknowledge that uh, you know the, the type of things that you can do. It's it should really be about uh, learning, about developing capabilities, about exploring what kind of use cases you can have, what works, what doesn't work, um, how you can, you know, in, take a step in this quantum journey, in this journey towards, you know, knowing not what it is and don't benefit from it, towards really uh, having the right people to benefit from quantum technology uh, in the future. Uh, and so that's really, uh, that's really our goal uh, as well. So this is a, a very high overview of the Capgemini quantum lab, the areas that we are in. So one side is really on the engineering things and doing technical things like uh, like system engineering and, and signal processing and, and all the engineering that that are relevant and necessary for hardware and for for scaling hardware. Uh, on the one hand, the other hand, we really work with clients to explore you know what this means and how they can uh, you know how they can find the right use case, etc. Um, and in the middle, we really try to find you know what are how does these how can you start proof of concepts with these use cases? How how can we um, uh, develop proof of concepts that will help us to understand what works and what doesn't work and what are the, uh, the technical feasibility and the, the business impacts, etc. Um, uh, and then it's it, there's much more than in quantum computing, quantum technology than just computing, right? There's quantum sensing, quantum networks, and, and communications infrastructure um, alongside as well in computing. The, one of the main focus has been uh, uh, in drug discovery and risk models. So today I'll talk about uh, the risk models uh, parts um, and and quantum finance in general. Um, so quantum finance is, I think, it's a it's a hugely interesting area for us. Um, and why? Uh, well, first um, we have a lot of clients that that are dealing with very big compute problems, right? So if, if you would say maybe very high over quantum computers are good at big compute problems, not necessarily big data problems, but data big problems would require a lot of compute power. Uh, and we see that a lot within uh, within finance. Uh, second, um, um, also maybe a little bit hand wavy, but uh, um, uh, finance financial models are, are often built on uncertainty models. Uh, and again, this is a quite a natural fit for for quantum systems. Uh, so we can um, um, we can map uh, problems from from finance relatively well to to these systems, um, and then there's a few applications that uh, that we see quite a lot. So first, um, 
uh, in optimization. So really uh, having a closed form optimization function where we try to maximize the uh, return for a given uh, for a given risk. Uh, there are all kinds of things which you can do that. So that this, there's either the, the quantum inspired solutions or really new type of algorithms that run on normal machines, uh, things like tensor networks uh, or simulated annealing um, or even uh, the, the, the quantum annealer, right? So what D-Wave has done uh, and, uh, and other type of uh, specialized type of quantum computers. Um, and then there's also, of course, a, a more gate-based model for, for doing this. Uh, then there's a lot of things in, in really modeling stochastic, uh, uh, stochastic behavior of markets or of uh, climate or of, uh, of, of, of financial products or whatever, all type of things that require uh, to simulate many different scenarios. Uh, so the Monte Carlo uh, simulations. Uh, and the idea is here that, that, that um, uh, you know, the, there are many different uh, Monte Carlo simulations already being done. We know that this is a huge area. We know that it requires a huge amount of compute power. And we also know that there's an algorithm that has a quadratic speed up potentially. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, so we, we hope that for some of these cases, we'll find an advantage for, for, um, for these problems. Uh, and third, really in the machine learning. And this is really a tricky area. It's really unknown what the, what the benefit, the speed up could be, uh, but there's a lot of hope that, uh, that there could be, uh, could be something faster. Um, as things like anti-money laundering, uh, AML, uh, but also, um, all kinds of classification, for example, so anti laundering is one form of classification, but you could also think about um, uh, uh, classification of, of what are good trades or what are bad trades, or maybe regression, you know, how will prices uh, progress in time um, and, and many other types of machine learning. Um, before I, I go uh, more into the, the risk models, Maybe very quick, so I'm not completely sure how uh, how deep your knowledge of quantum systems is. So I won't go into into many of the details, but the three things I wanted to mention is that, you know, the, a, a key area that we want to explore is to find, you know, what is, uh, on the one hand, what is the, the, the business opportunity from certain use cases? How, how much will companies actually benefit from this? And that, of course, res relates to how how much things will be speed up, sped up. Uh, and on the other hand, other hand, how realistic is this? Uh, is there a, what's the, the technical feasibility of, of doing this? And, and how do you look beyond the, the hype? Right. Uh, it's, it, I think it's really important at this stage to to not uh, to be very realistic about what, about what is possible, um, and acknowledge that these systems are still in its infancy. And it will take, still take many, many years before they are, you know, matured enough to, to do something. Um, and it really helps to identify, you know, what are some metrics that we can keep in mind um, and that we can uh, use as, as milestones to, to see, um, you know, when, when these systems will become relevant and where to position this and where we can prepare for certain applications. Um, so three, uh, three metrics to keep in mind. Uh, the first one, the... Um, the number of qubits. Mm. Obviously, this is the most being talked about. Uh, IBM system from recently has 127 qubits. Um, this doubles uh, approximately every uh, every year or so. Um, so next year we have the 400, or this year we have the 400 qubit machine from IBM, and then a thousand, and then um, you know maybe um, maybe a million or so in, in 10 years. Um, so that's that's good progress, but it's, it's it's it will take some time, and it's definitely not the only metric. The other metric is is the the how you know how error prone these gates are. So I'm not sure if you know how to read this, uh, but uh, this is the way the quantum circuits are, or where like low level quantum circuits are usually uh, shown. So we have a number of qubits here, uh, and on these qubits we do certain operations or gates. Uh, so all these uh, these things are, are gates. So this is uh, something called the Hadamard gate, and this is called a, a Toffoli gate. Um, this is a gate that's acting on one qubit. This is a gate that's acting on two qubits. This is a controlled not gate. Um, so and um, uh, the the gate fidelity is how how well do these um, uh, gates how how well do do they work? Uh, 
Uh, one qubit gates are typically a bit better, so like 99.9% uh, and two qubit gates are, are a bit little worse, um, like 99% more or less. Uh, so that what that, does that mean? It means that you can expect an error to occur maybe every 100 steps or so. So every uh, depth of, of the circuit, how every step that I take, um, there's a certain probability of happening. So with a, with a fidelity of 99.9%, it happens every hundred uh, uh, or thousand times, right? So if, if I have a deep uh, algorithm that takes a lot of steps, then it will be very likely that there will be errors. Um, so, and the first thing is uh, speeds. So um, uh, the speed the, is, in, is how fast these, uh, these layers are occurring. So how fast you can do a, a set of gates. Uh, currently the, the quantum, uh, the, the speed from the quantum system is much worse than classical systems. So in classical computers, you have uh, you know, the clock speed, gigahertz, so it means like a, a billion operations per second. Um, in quantum computers, you have something called uh, circuit layer operations per second. So it's uh, equivalent to, uh, to the clock speed. Um, and it's in the order of uh, like a thousand or, or five thousand, ten thousand. So 10 to the power three. Um, so it's like a million times worse than, than, than quantum systems. Uh, sorry, a million times worse than classical systems. And what is additionally a problem is that um, uh, as soon as we will have error corrected uh, systems, we'll get much more overhead, right? So we get a lot of trouble if, because um, every layer that we try to uh, execute, we have to do the error correction and we have to build this in redundancy of qubits and there will be many, many more qubits that we have to operate on and that we have to control. Um, and so uh, the speed will really go uh, like, so we probably use like a thousand logical qubits, uh, a thousand physical qubits per logical qubits, uh, which also means that the speed would really go uh, a thousand times lower. Um, so this is really also a metric to keep in mind. Um, because if if this doesn't improve, then even because even if quantum computers are you know periodically or exponentially faster, for some problems it may still not be not be good enough. It may still be uh, too slow. Um, yeah, right. So a bit of an overview of um, what are most important and and what what we really try to do for our clients as well is to have an understanding. You know. What is the business impact? Well, how 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 much will we benefit from it? You know, what if uh, what if you could have a risk model that um, uh, that that calculates the price of a derivative ten percent better? Uh, you know, what is the business value from this? And on the other hand, um, when can when can we expect this more or less? And is this something that is realistic in five years or twenty years or? Um, and, and what do you have to look out for to, uh, to, to, to see if this is happening? Um, so a little bit about Monte Carlo. So I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I uh, think that most of you must be uh, uh, a little bit up, uh, aware of, of the idea. Um, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this example here to calculate the, uh, the value of pi by just randomly throwing darts at a, at a uh, uh, square here and estimating the volume uh, of the sphere and therefore calculating the, the number of pi. You can of course see that the more darts you throw, the better you can have an estimate of the volume of, of the, the circle and therefore better calculate the number of pi. So you can see that with increased number of shots, it, it, you, you, you get close to, um, uh, to close to the real value of, of pi. Uh, and this skills classically with um, uh, with uh, uh, with one over the square root of, of your error. So if you want to have an error rate of uh, 10 to the power minus five, which is kind of standard, I think, for, for many of these Monte Carlo systems for in finance, uh, you require 10 billion samples, right? So that, um, that that becomes quite big. And then of course, if, you know, if your samples are super quick, uh, as super easy, you can do this very quickly. But if uh, if your samples are, you know, if each sample takes you a lot of time, then this will become prohibitively uh, long. Um, and uh, so and the other thing with with quantum systems is that you can do this one over the uh, uh, one over the error. So for for a uh, accuracy of uh, uh, for an error rate of ten to the minus five, 
this gives you a hundred thousand times speed up potentially. Uh, and this is of course the reason why uh, why companies are exploring this um, because you know if if and, and and it probably won't be that easy, but if you could really make something a hundred thousand times faster, you know this would really completely change the world. Um, so let me go into this a bit later. Um, so and, and this would completely change the world. So one one uh, one example of this is, for example, derivative market, right? So derivatives are uh, are financial products uh, like like option. So an op an option is something that uh, you can uh, buy a a stock. Uh, you have the, the option to buy something in the future. Um, and there are many different, uh, like many different for, uh, derivatives. Um, uh, so all type of products that are uh, uh, depending on something else that you, that you can that you can buy. Um, and the total, uh, the total market of derivative pricing is one quadrillion. So that's ten to the power fifteen, uh, right? So that's a, a million billion dollars per year. So that's that's the amount of uh, trades that are are yearly done. So that's that's for, that's roughly ten times the world GDP. So the the amount of of uh, the volume of risk is is just mind boggling big. I would say it's like so big. There's so much so much money being traded in in these kind of uh, financial products that if you can you know have bought a better product or if you can calculate this price better or if you uh, you don't require huge server farms to calculate this every day or every minute. Um, or if you can, instead of calculating this once per week, you can calculate this once per, per second, for example, and uh, open up a completely new market. Um, because, I don't know, for some reason, people want to buy derivatives on the, on the second basis instead of on a, on a week basis. Uh, for example, to hedge or to to something or to have new products. You know, this could really um, the, be a mind boggling uh, um, uh, uh, potential markets and so of course the idea is if you can use these quantum Monte Carlo um, yeah you can really um, uh, there's really a, a lot of money to be made um, so so but and then the question is okay so how do we, and, and that's also what what we and many of our, of our clients are looking for so how how do you find the right problem within this derivative trading right like uh, not all derivatives are um, not all derivatives are um, uh, uh, are very difficult. So some derivatives you can just have you can calculate analyti analytically. So there is like a closed form uh, formula that you can calculate um, and then determine the price. So you don't need to use these Monte Carlo systems. Um, so this 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 formula is called the Black Scholes uh, equation. Um, so you want to have a, a difficult error, a difficult um, derivative, something that is complex to calculate. Otherwise, you know, why why bother using quantum systems? Uh, but maybe you don't want to take the most difficult ones. Because if you, if you take the, the super difficult ones, it may be not be feasible in the in the near term. Uh, but it will be will require quantum computers that are, you know, many many years out there. Um, so it's it's really a balance to find you know what is possible within as soon as possible with these quantum systems, which is a uh, realistic uh, uh, and um, like practical advantage over classical systems, but still doable. Uh, so there are a couple of things that make these that make these uh, derivatives more complex. So for example, one thing is is uh, is path dependency. So if you have a uh, um, if you have a uh, an um, option where you're not only interested in, for example, the price of a, of a derivative over five years, but you're interested in every time uh, a frame, you know, a, a, along the way to these five years, you have much more uh, samples to take, right? Because you need only not only to do one sample for the end of the five year, but you need to know all the values of your of your price in between. Uh, so this could make it much more complex. Um, Something else that could make it more complex, for example, is if you have, um, if you are really looking to some exotic events in in the tail risk uh, that you are trying to explore, um, 
or if you are trying to explore maybe what the sensitivity uh, or you want to take some gradients uh, so so you have to recalculate your samples many times for for different scenarios so all, all kinds of things that make these these derivatives more um, uh, more complex uh, and to give you a bit of a feeling for you know what is what is complex what isn't um, uh, for some research, I think this was from um, Goldman Sachs and IBM. Uh, they showed that that with simple derivatives, you can model them in approximately like a like a like a thousand uh, gates, and then model it a uh, hundred thousand, and then ten million. Um, so that's the, the 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 number of gates that you need you, that you need to use to model uh, the derivatives, um, and it shows you a bit of an understanding how how deep your circuits would go. Then in this uh, uh, this research was was from uh, from Goldman where they really did an end to end estimation, so really to explore from uh, like the whole circuit, from from everything, from from the, uh, the everything that, that's needed to calculate the price, like how how big the complexity was, um, and that for two different type of of um, of derivatives, so something called auto callable, which is a path dependent um, uh, derivative and something called the TARF, which is just another type of derivative. Um, and you can see here that you know even in the in this in the simplest case, you already need 10 million uh, uh, t depth. So t depth is a t is for the Toffoli gate, so it's the number of gates. Uh, so you need 10 million steps or or gates uh, to to calculate this, which really shows that you know this is far beyond the reach of uh, of classical systems uh, because with or sorry far beyond the reach of of current day quantum systems because with current day quantum systems remember that if you have uh, like a two qubit error error rate of like 99.9 percent .9%, for example you can only do 100 steps um, and here you need to have uh, uh, 10 million steps so you really need error correction to to make this work uh, and in terms of number of qubits um, uh, it, they uh, they showed that for, you know you need at least like eight thousand uh, qubits, which is maybe more seems more re more doable. Um, but then uh, because they had to be uh, error corrected, you know you need many more qubits to to compensate for for uh, uh, for your physical qubit, in many physical qubits to get a logical qubit. So this really builds up to uh, to a lot of qubits. Right, so and then the third metrics really in terms of speed. So you can imagine that if um, if I have all this overhead and all this time that I require to calculate and then um, uh, if these systems are, are so slow that that, you know, it, it may not be enough. So you, and the speed up might not be uh, that much faster that my reduced clock speed will compensate for it. Uh, so what they show here is that now, even uh, so, on the uh, the y-axis here is the, the clock speed, uh, and on the x-axis is the the two, two qubit uh, effective two qubit gate error. Um, that even with um, you know, if I have a super high clock speed, uh, so uh, a gigahertz uh, as mentioned here, you know, I, I still don't get a speed up. I, I need both a good um, a good clock speed and a good error two qubit error rate in order to get into this blue area. Where I hope to have a, a speed up, um, and then part of this research, which was from QC, where they showed that um, uh, that there may be some trade off that you can do. So you may be able to trade off some uh, some speed up um, for reduced hardware requirements. Um, and again, that that is really a big part of the the current day work to really find, you know, what can I trade off what can I how can I find the best set that is interesting for me that will help me to, to find an advantage as soon as possible which is still worth it um, you know, and, and of course there are all kinds of things that you can do you can try to think and there's and that's really good that that you guys are here um, because it, it's so open right there are so many things that are left to explore uh, you can think about having better uh, loading your data more efficiently, uh, maybe with reduced accuracy. And, and for example, with loading your data 
instead of doing explicitly doing it with a machine learning, a quantum machine learning model, um, you can think about how can I trade off some of the work that the quantum computer does on a classical computer um, and therefore uh, reducing the, the constraints on your quantum systems um, and making it more relevant in the near term. Um, you, you can think about uh, other types of more efficient implementations um, of, of, of amplitude estimation, so the, the search algorithm or you know better, all kinds of things that you can do. Um, and it's really in the for initial phases, right? We're really in a phase where there is so much open to be done and where there's so much input that people can bring from other areas, from machine learning, from finance, from uh, whatever areas to to inspire uh, better solutions and better algorithms. Um, another example where I have a small demo from uh, that I want to show is more about risk analysis. Um, so that's, again, this is a Monte Carlo type of uh, application where you try to monitor, try to um, uh, um, see how um, how with some with with a with a model that is based on uncertainty, uh, so where you get many different possible outcomes, how you can uh, efficiently sample all these different scenarios, and, and uh, by by doing this many iteratively times with the Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, find out what you uh, uh, like how this how this risk model behaves. Um, and it has again loads of opportunities uh, from from calculating what, for example, climate risk could do or catastrophe modeling um, for to stress testing, seeing how uh, uh, how banks or countries or companies would behave under some shockwave of, of stress, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And especially if we then and I think about you know what if you are exploring, for example, how sensitive some sort of systems will be, or it, it easily becomes um, difficult problems to, to simulate. Um, so the, the risk, uh, the, the example that I wanted to show is uh, from a paper from, um, from a, a German company called Jos Quantum, uh, and they, they modeled this, this toy problem, right? So one thing to mention here that um, whatever you do in uh, a quantum computing algorithmic space at this point is probably a, uh, a, a, a toy problem because we just don't have the, the, the computers that are big enough to, to simulate something. Um, but the, but the, the, the challenge then is to find something that is still relevant, that is still giving you enough information um, you know, to find the right use cases, to find how this will uh, uh, what the business value will be eventually, and to to make sure that that it helps you to take this step in this in this quantum journey. So, what is um, um, what is the uh, the idea here? The idea is that there is a model um, that uh, that models risk, um, and um, and that we can implement this on the quantum computer. So in this case, we have four different risk items. So there's uh, there's the chance that country X will have a uh, you know nothing will happens uh, status quo, 80% probability, and it has an exclusive uh, relationship with the, the the probability that there is a political crisis. So in this case, 20% probability of uh, a political crisis occurring. Um, then there are some conditional uh, relations. So if a political crisis occurs. Uh, there's a probability that there will be a uh, fun, uh, foreign exchange volatility increase, uh, which with 40% probability. So if this happens, then this will also happen with 40% probability. Um, and this also has a 5% probability to happen anyway, an intrinsic probability. Uh, and in this case, um, uh, there is a intrinsic probability of, of 10, and um, uh, and a fifty percent probability if this happens that this will also happen. Uh, so so again, this is just a toy problem, right? This is a small problem uh, that was implemented by this by this company uh, called Jos. Um, and uh, but there are many interesting things to ask here. Uh, so for example, the 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 one thing you can ask is, what is the probability that my um, you know that that my uh, Political system or my country, however, what this is, 
uh, will default or that it will that it will crash. Uh, so, for example, you could say you know it will crash if the impact is uh, twelve or higher. So, what is the probability that uh, that the total increase, the total impact of twelve will happen? Or you could ask, um, what is the what is the sensitivity of uh, my system to crash uh, according to some of these uh, these parameters? So, for example, um, you know, what if what if uh, there is an increased probability of a political crisis because because there are some political struggles uh, in the in the country, for example? What what extra probability would that give me uh, uh, for this crash? Um, or maybe you are interested in a combination of uh, of, of scenarios. For example, um, you want to simulate that uh, that there is an increased probability of political crisis, uh, but uh, the the uh, FX volatility is uh, for some reason very low, um, right? And and how does that behave? And then very quickly becomes very difficult, right? Because you want to simulate this 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 risk model for many different scenarios. Uh, and of course, that, that's uh, where uh, quantum systems uh, might come in. Um, so, um, so I have implemented this uh, this model on uh, on Qiskit uh, that I was quickly going to want to go through mm. because I think it's it's quite a nice, uh, elegant implementation for a, a quantum system. Uh, so the idea is okay, so what what um, uh, how, how, should, how can I implement this? How, how could it look like? So this I mentioned earlier that, that these uncertainty models have a relatively native mapping to quantum systems, right? They can be relatively easily mapped to a system. And here that shows. So how this is implemented is that each of these risk items is uh, is modeled as one qubit. Um, so if it has a, a state one, it means that the, that the state is triggered. If it has state zero, it means it's not triggered. If it has 80% probability, it means it has an, an angle um, uh, that corresponds to this 80% uh, uh, probability. Um, and this can be relatively easily implemented, right? Uh, because I could just have a rotation gate. Um, then there are these controlled or these these the transition probabilities. So if this happened, then this will happen uh, with with forty percent. And again, this can be relatively straightforwardly um, implemented uh, because I can have a controlled uh, rotation gate. So if this is on, uh, if this is uh, this is happening, then uh, increase the probability of this with forty percent. Uh, with a controlled rotation gate. Um, and then uh, this has a 5% probability of uh, of happening uh, anyway. Uh, and this gate, the, the exclusive OR gate, uh, can also be relatively straightforwardly uh, implemented um, with, uh, uh, with just a controlled NOT gate, right? Um, so if this is, this is uh, zero, uh, then this should be one. So it's it's not really a controlled NOT gate. It's like an, an a reversed controlled NOT gate, right? Because usually a, a controlled NOT gate triggers with the control if if that's one, and then it triggers the other one to get the opposite state. But this is the opposite, um, but very related. So how does that look like on a basic short uh, quantum uh, circuit? Um, so we have here our our four risk items. Uh, uh, one to uh, zero to three, and we see here that this is the the single qubit rotation uh, gate. So right, so this always corresponds to this eighty percent probability of this happening. Uh, then we see this this XOR gate. We see the back here as well. So right, we see again that that there is this uh, controlled NOT gate. So if this is uh, this is one, it triggers the other qubit. It flips the the bit of of the other uh, qubit. Uh, like I mentioned, it's kind of like re reverse because it has to trigger at zero instead of one, uh, so that can easily be fixed by uh, by having those those x gates, right? Because uh, uh, so if this is one, uh, sorry, if this is zero, it has to flip it. So I first flip it to one, then this gate is active, and then I return it to its original state. Um, so uh, so 
so I hope that you see in some to some degree that this this part here corresponds to this uh, this uh, this model, um, and that it's a relatively uh, elegant uh, uh, implementation or risk model because it's it only requires a linear number of qubits per risk items, um, and it only requires the number of gates per number of interactions that we have. Um, so it, 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 it's yeah, the, the complexity is, is relatively modest. Um, so the next thing is, you know, in this case, we're interested in, um, uh, there's some um, marks. In this case, we're interested in uh, in seeing what the probability is of this, this system to crash, of this system to default uh, to, to some impact that we that we set up as a threshold. Uh, so we need to sum up these, these, uh, these impacts in our system. Right, so this, this can easily be done by having a, a register. So we have a register that uh, that that uh, where the first qubit, for example, is uh, corresponds to the value one, and the second qubit corresponds to the value two, and a four, a sixteen, uh, and we um, we save the value there if, if uh, to add up the values of these impacts, uh, and we can implement this using uh, controlled not gates. Um, but in this case, I, I try. I wanted to keep it simple. And I think that's what this shows is, so I, I used a standard function from uh, from Qiskit, which is just an adder, just so it's something that adds up the values. Uh, and I think this is really also an example of uh, of where this, this technology is, right? So you don't have to, to figure out everything anymore yourself. You can use a lot of predefined functions from uh, from Qiskit or from, um, or from, um, uh, other companies from IBM or from from whatever uh, to start programming on this, um, and you know you need to to know uh, you know some details and and how these gates work, but you don't need to know everything anymore. Um, right. So eventually, uh, so okay, I, I have a register here where I save my uh, my qubits. Um, I want to know if this exceeded a certain threshold. So I have this this double doubly controlled not gate. So if uh, in this case, the the values of um, uh, my two qubits that correspond to the the value uh, the threshold of twelve, I uh, save this in this boolean value um, that um, uh, that corresponds then to the probability of this system to to crash. Um, I go through it relatively quickly, right? So uh, I hope it's more or less clear, but but don't worry about the, the details. Um, so this is so. Where does it bring me now? Uh, what what I have is at this point is that I know what the probability is of this system to crash, and this probability is saved in my uh, in my uh, uh, ancilla qubit. Um, and now I can extract this value with amplitude estimation. So that the search algorithm that uh, finds the value uh, finds the the amplitude uh, of some qubits, uh, and I know now what the the probability is of uh, of this system to crash. So I, I ran it here, so it's it just very quickly to go to show how this looks. So, so you have uh, you know predefined functions in Qiskit, um, and I end up with a value of five percent. So there you have it. It's a very small uh, problem, uh, probably not very commercially uh, uh, interesting right away. Um, but of course, the hope is that this uh, that someday you can uh, you can scale this up, um, and you can make it of course more complex, uh, like like I mentioned before, to really look at the, for example, the sensitivities, uh, not just what the probability is, but what the probability of this thing to crash corresponding to some type of variables uh, uh, or some type of scenarios, for example, that the political crisis are, is more likely. Right, so. Um, um, take some water. Mm. So this is. Um, just an example, right? It's an example that uh, that shows some of the, the the models that you can implement today. It shows um, that this is something that is not mature yet, uh, but where you can nonetheless already start programming. It shows that you can have a, an understanding of what the speed up could be um, and what the potential business benefits could be. So you can kind of search for, you know, Maybe it's not interesting if I just look at the uh, probability of default, but maybe it is interesting enough uh, when I look at the sensitivities. So it, it's it's like a search or a journey or however you want to call it to 
to find the right use cases and to find what works and what doesn't work. Um, and by implementing it, you, you get a much better understanding of, of how this could look like. Um, so in, in this case, what what uh, what is I mean the the, the four four qubit uh, implementation so the with the four risk items is is probably not uh, commercially relevant. Um, but uh, uh, what I understood is that you know from the in the order of a hundred or a few hundred uh, risk items, it becomes uh, commercially uh, relevant. So then there will be a lot of uh, use cases within finance, but also within um, whatever uh, in every, risk models are everywhere, right? So um, risk models or, or climate models or maybe insurers or whatever that uh, that 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 uh, that might want to uh, might, might find it interesting uh, from from that that kind of sizes. Uh, and additionally, if you want to look not just uh, uh, at the risk itself, but really at the sensitivity analysis. So what is the, the, the hardware requirements you would need for this? So in terms of qubits, we saw that it was relatively elegant, right? So I needed one qubit uh, per risk items. So that scales linearly. Um, and then we had all this overhead, right? So I had this register for, uh, for adding up my qubits. I had a, a, a register for the uh, to extract the value of, with amplitude estimation um, and, so, and some other things, so all kinds of overhead. Um, so in this case, at 400 qubits, it means that you would need about 200 qubits. Um, oh, uh, but uh, yeah, so, so that, that's very modest. Um, then the number of gates. Uh, so you need uh, you need gates for the amplitude estimation, so for the quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, so as we saw before, that scales with one over the error. Uh, so suppose that um, uh, you have a uh, um, an, an error rate of uh, ten to the power of minus three. You need a thousand thousand uh, um, uh, samples, or yeah, a thousand samples. Um, in this case, if you want to do the uh, these, the sensitivity analysis, uh, you can do this with a, a Grover search or it search with uh, with the the square root of n. So in total, um, summing this up, it uh, comes brings me to 10 million number of gates. Um, so and, and this also shows that you know this, the number of gates quickly becomes quite a lot, right? Like in um, um, uh, you would think that. You know, when you start, you only have a few gates. You only have one gate for each of the interactions, uh, and it seems like it's it's very modest and it, it, it isn't so much. Uh, but then, uh, you know, you have to repeat this whole process in the in, in the amplitude estimation, which really increases the number of uh, of gates. And then, um, uh, then there are all kinds of overhead, like these adders and all kinds of other things, and all these things add up until eventually it becomes quite big. Um, into this uh, 10 million number of, of gates. Um, and even here, I, I probably assumed a lot of things like um, uh, uh, if you really compile this to a, a machine code, you know, there are all these additional operations because some of the gates that I used are probably not available. So, for example, I use these double controlled gates, uh, which are not existing in, in quantum systems, but in, in, in reality, you implement them using. Uh, a composite of, of some uh, of some gates, so the the actual number of gates typically grows uh, uh, quite fast, um, and so this is definitely not an example for a, um, a NISC era type of uh, application. So uh, application in the near term noisy intermediate scale quantum computer, but much more for the uh, for the long term uh, fault tolerant error corrected uh, uh, system. Um, right, so uh, so this is uh, just one example. Um, uh, I, I have another example here, but I think. Uh, do we want to have a short break before Sam starts? Yeah. And uh, uh, we are left with another five minutes or so. Uh, okay. Yeah. So so let me uh, let me round off then. Um, so. This is another 
uh, well, another thing what I want to show here is that this is this is another example of uh, work that we did with the clients in financial services for portfolio optimization. Um, and there are so many different parts to, to this to this quantum algorithm, right? There, there is the, the quantum algorithm itself. Uh, there you have to prepare your data. You have to um, uh, precondition your data in, in the right format and in the right um, uh, um, uh, yeah, and, and to decompose the problem so that you only send the, the most difficult part to your quantum computer. So what what will brings you in the end is that you really need to start thinking about the larger computational workflow, not just about your quantum algorithm, but how this will work uh, with uh, with everything that you do. So for the risk uh, risk data, for example, you can already think about how can I pre calculate some some distribution functions, for example, classically, and then load them into my quantum systems uh, or uh, that will speed things up. So, you, and then you really think about the larger, larger workflow. And if you do that, um, uh, and if you really think about, uh, get your hands dirty with programming these systems, think about the, the when it will bring you value and how it will bring you value, then you can take very significant steps in uh, into adoption of these these circuits, and of course the idea is that that eventually um, this will help you to um, uh, to get an a competitive advantages over 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 uh, competitors, um, and uh, and leverage these systems uh, as much maximum as possible. So let me skip this part about machine learning. Um, a few conclusions. Uh, um, First of all, there there is a huge mar potential market for for financial services, right? So, um, if you can speed things up uh, with uh, with quantum um, quantum Monte Carlo or quantum machine learning or whatever, then um, then the, the, there there is a, just a huge market. So the the derivative trade was one quadrillion. Um, these quadratic speed ups are uncertain, right? So if you remember those those pictures with where you saw the the clock speed and the two qubit gates uh, and the number of qubits, so we really need to improve on all levels. If we don't improve on uh, um, on on all these aspects of the uh, of the of the hardware, it won't be enough. If we only have like ten million qubits, but not not a good enough uh, two qubit error gate, then it means nothing. Um, so for those Monte Carlo simulations to work, there is a lot of uh, improvements still necessary from um, uh, from quantum systems. With quantum machine learning, I really didn't really touch on it, uh, but it's it's a very interesting area with with a lot of potential. Uh, but basically, nothing has been proven yet, or almost nothing. Um, so uh, it could could work, but until it's it's really there, uh, you know, we still have to see it. Um, and so, because it because it, it is uncertain, and because it is uh, extremely uh, disruptive, uh, you know the best way to prepare for it is to to explore this carefully, uh, to get your hands dirty, to try out what it is, uh, to find the right people, to build the right teams, um, and so really to, uh, to 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 take on this 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 quantum journey. Um, right. So I wanted to stop. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, Sam is also here. And um, are there any questions? Yes. Are there any questions? Please raise your hand. I see one question. Yes. Yes, Mr. Ampur, you can. Uh, thank yourself. you. Thank you, Julian, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So the the model that you had for like a toy model, where I didn't understand how you map the probability to the controlled rotation. Um, so with the controlled rotation gates. So um, um, uh, so yeah. controlled rotation gates are just the native uh, gates in the in in the, uh, many hardware setups. So is your question like how? Like no, I, my question was the probability of eighty percent where you started with. How did you map it to the controlled rotation? Ah, so okay, so I mean, if you have a, if you if you know the, the block sphere, right? If you have a, uh, uh, so the the angle which you rotate it corresponds to so with probability you're changing. 
Uh, so you have to do this 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 uh, this mapping from eighty percent to a um, how do you call that like a azimuth angle, uh, which is just like the the cosine rule uh, to 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 map this. Uh, but then you get an angle and you can just rotate your qubit along the block sphere into your right direction. Um, so okay. and, and and then you have this controlled rotation gate. So but maybe also part of your question is like how do you implement this on hardware? Um, and that depends on what type of hardware you have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just was keen on the mapping how you did. And the second question that I had was on the measurement. So the uh, the outcome of your uh, circuit in the in the toy model, you want to do these measurements. Is my understanding correct that uh, the outcome of your measurements is going to be an estimate of the risk? Is that correct? Uh, outcome of your measurement of the risk. Yes. So, uh, so, so first, your, your first question, like, uh, what is the mapping? So, this is the uh, they return the the angle that you do corresponding to some uh, 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 some probability. So, it's just a basic uh, like um, um, mathematics to 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 convert uh, the, the the reference systems. Um, and then your second question. Uh, so, indeed, what the the goal here was was to get the probability of the systems to uh, to go beyond the threshold of a certain impact. Um, so with with the amplitude estimation, so the search algorithm, uh, I retrieve the amplitude of the uh, of the qubit that that uh, that has the probability of um, of exceeding this uh, this threshold, um, and I, and that's what I measure. Okay, got it. Thanks. Any other questions? If you have uh, questions uh, later, you can also, of course, always uh, email them. Also now, of course. Yes, Mr. Chirinji, you have this word. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, so Julian, I have a question related to like this is a very naive question. So I work in machine learning, do not have much uh, sense of these uh, quantum uh, systems. Um, uh, but several of your claims, I, like what I heard uh, from Quantum Monte Carlo, right, are generic claims, nothing to do with finance per se, right? Uh, so yeah, one of the yeah. hard problems uh, which I've been engaged in is uh, falls under the realm of approximate inference. Of, yeah. uh, for example, you know, Bayesian networks and things like that, right? So, uh, uh, the, my question is um, that: uh, Do you know any literature, or do you, or do you know is that a fruitful venue of investigation? Um, I know, I know Monte Carlo methods, but I do not know quantum Monte Carlo. I'm familiar with all the methods which people use in literature in our fields, yeah. but I have no idea about quantum Monte Carlo. So, uh, so I just wanted to know your thoughts. So is it like you know? Mm, is that uh, what it is? And of course, finance is a very exciting thing, but that we'll talk later. I, anyway. Yeah. So, so on a high level, um, uh, there is so much from machine learning um, uh, that can still map to quantum um, uh, algorithms, right? So, in general, all these insights could be very relevant. So, and in particular with uh, with Bayesian interference and related things, I I, I remember a couple of. Um, uh, papers that that are uh, working on this, I would I suggest uh, what I really usually use is um, uh, this database. Oh, wait, let me share my screen again, where um, the, a lot of papers are shown. Oh. Um, so if you go to Airtable, oh, let me just put it in the chat. Uh, on this uh, database, there is uh, what is it? Six six hundred papers that are within the Q IBM Q network. Um, and there is definitely some um, a lot of work on on these kind of uh, what's with this or experimental Bayesian estimation of quantum state. Per well, uh, let, I don't know the answers right now, but here is there is a lot of interesting research about the things that you mentioned. I put it in the chat. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, maybe I should look at. Yeah, I'm sure it's an exploding field. A lot to learn. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um,
I saw one other question. Sorry, there's an under question. Uh, Professor Jungit, you can go ahead with the question. Uh, Dr. Julian, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Julian, for a wonderful uh, introduction to your quantum journey in the field of finance. I was just wondering uh, if you use this option, uh, how fast can you eventually hope to get uh, be able to compete with the existing models of uh, climate or finance where the difficulty is they are quite slow and unable to predict uh, you know, severe events like uh, whatever happens. Uh, do you think uh, in the couple of uh, in the years to come your quantum option will be faster than what we have today with the regular predictions? Yeah, so um, um, so I think that the number so the, the all three um, areas are improving, right? So the so the three metrics that I discussed, uh, I think all of it is is really uh, getting better. Let me share this slide again. Um, so um, I think in the number of qubits, we can really expect a, a, a doubling every year or so. So from a hundred now to maybe a million in ten years. Uh, I think the number of the effective two qubit error rate, I think now it's maybe 10 to the minus three. I hope that uh, with superconducting qubits, we may go to uh, maybe one or two orders of magnitude higher eventually. So 10 to the power minus five um, or maybe a little bit better. And then clock speed would also increase probably not um, as much as uh, doubling per year or something, but will definitely increase. Um, so eventually, I could definitely see a advantage here, uh, but uh, the 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 question is how long will it take? Um, yes. And uh, I think for for derivative pricing, uh, or for these like these there, these are definitely not the first uh, applications. So if you have a uh, uh, like some lattice models in 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 physics, or maybe some some type of uh, quantum chemistry, it will probably might be much easier to map. Uh, or maybe some machine learning, so quantum machine learning where it's very heuristically uh, and the speed up won't be uh, deterministic or uh, or um, uh, maybe not as big as, as here, but that will probably be a uh, speed up earlier. Thank you, Dr. Giga. Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, I'll stop here then and I give enough time for still for, uh, for Sam. Or okay, stop. And uh, uh, Sam, I, uh, I thought I had to leave this hour, but I'll be here as well. So I, I enjoy uh, uh, listening to your talk. Thanks very much, Julian. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Julian, for this wonderful talk. Uh, so before you uh, start, uh, can I just give a brief introduction and then you can start with the session. So Dr. Sam uh, Janway has completed his master's in the University of Cambridge. He then went on to do his PhD at Imperial College, College London in quantum dynamics and thermalization. His postdoctoral research was in simulation of open quantum systems at the University of Nottingham. Now he has many years of experience in supporting commercial R&D organizations with cutting edge technologies. Today, he'll be talking to us on applications of quantum computing in drug discovery. Over to you, Dr. Sam. Thanks very much indeed. It's a it's a real pleasure to be here. And can I just check? Can you see my my screen? Is it coming through? OK, fantastic. Excellent. So it's a little bit of a bold title, actually, Opportunities for Quantum Computing, um, given that it's a, you know, it's a nascent technology. So maybe I should have put potential uh, opportunities for quantum computing, but we're quite at the start of our journey in this area. And um, I want to share with you today some of the areas that we we, we think are going to be uh, um, exciting over the years ahead. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that the team is starting uh, to work on in, in, in this area. So let's begin by giving a little bit of an outline um, as to what the, the, the plan is for the next um, the next session. So. I was going to give a little bit of background to um, to the area of, um, of of pharmaceutical development. I was going to give a little bit of a background to myself, with actually, with the fantastic introduction. I think there's um, a little need for me to say so much on that, um, but this was just to set the context in terms of where I'm uh, where I'm coming from in approaching this topic. 
Um, and then in the first part of the talk, I would like to really just give a little bit of detail, maybe just four or five slides about the process of drug discovery and the challenges, so that then in the in the bulk of the talk, I can discuss some of the applications um, and show you where some of those challenges uh, actually find some um, so, so, some potential value within uh, within the industry, or at least they will do in in, in future. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the nearer term, um, potentially nearer term uh, application areas. Um, do some wider reviewing of other 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 applications that people are looking at um, before we wrap up. So let's begin uh, by digging into a background a little bit. So I'm not I won't say too much more about myself. I just want to say I'm a I'm a formerly a, a theoretical physicist who's now been in the commercial world for a long time, um, looking at some of the challenges which R and D organisations uh, face. So. For me, it's really exciting to be at this in intersection of a of a topic which I was um, once heavily involved in from a research perspective. Now, now trying to 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 bring it, um, uh, you know, bring it to um, to a commercial audience and help help organisations think about how they can um, b become ready for these new technical technological uh, challenges. So. Uh, with Julian, uh, I, I'm, I'm a member of the, the Quantum Lab team, but you may also see from the branding on my slides, I'm from a, from a team called Hybrid Intelligence within Capgemini Engineering, which is the, the part of the business um, um, which actually focuses on, on, on some of these uh, R&D um, challenges, really at the sort of intersection of science technology um, in the commercial world. So that's a bit of background on, on where I come from and hopefully motivates why this is an interesting topic for me uh, and for, for the organisation as a whole. I'd like to move on, if I could, to talk a little bit about why why drug discovery and why life sciences. So it may not be um, an industry that people have uh, too much knowledge about, but it's actually, uh, uh, unsurprisingly, an absolutely huge industry. So uh, an industry with a trillion dollar annual revenue. But it's unusual compared to other ind uh, industries because the products take a very long time to um, to create, usually sort of 10 to 12 years or so from the beginning of the R&D process through to actually being able to sell a product. Um, but it also costs an awful lot of money, so sort of typically over $2 billion to de develop a drug. Now, that in itself is, again, that probably doesn't make it unique. There are other industries where R&D timescales are long. But actually, from when you start testing your product on um, on people, you find that uh, only about one in 20 of those um, th those potential products makes it through to the market. So that shows it's a very expensive business. It's a very time consuming business and anything that can be done to to accelerate this um, th this process is hugely valuable. And in fact, it's for this reason that many of the companies that we're used to uh, um, in terms of the big names in this space, they, they, they have they have fairly large revenues. You have to be in the sort of tens of billions to be able to take the to the sorts of risks that are involved in in, in drug discovery because um, it, it's really a pipeline where a lot of things don't don't work out, um, and we we really work hard to uh, to improve them. So why specifically actually does that matter? I suppose it's not obvious at first glance. If it takes a long time, okay, that that's fine. It takes a long time, but we get there in the end, and then we get a, a you know a valuable product. Well. Actually, the way it works in uh, in the life sciences world, in the, in the in the world of pharmaceutical development, is that once you reach the point of actually, um, uh, uh, you know, establishing a, a, a potential um, drug where you understand the mechanism, you typically will patent it so that um, so that no one else can lay claim to it. But from that point onwards, you have a huge amount of development still to do both in terms of uh, optimization, lab work to check that it's safe, um, and indeed clinical trials. And your patent is only valid for 20 years. So it's a real, um, it's it's a real effort to make sure that you're able to get your um, get your product released to the market with still having enough uh, enough, enough years um, left on the patent before other people can start making your 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 product at, um, and sell it for significantly less. And if we couple that with a, just a quick view over the last few decades where the uh, the number of drugs per billion dollars of research spending has actually been falling exponentially. So uh, decade on decade, it's becoming increasingly, increasingly more expensive to to come up with new drug products. Um, and therefore, I think um, from my point of view, the, the the exciting thing about being involved in new technologies is that, well, in industries like this where it's becoming increasingly challenging um, to, to, to bring new products to patients, 
actually we, we can hope to have an impact with uh, with technological solutions. So I'm going to dig into a little bit about just that those, some of those areas where um, where there are challenges in drug discovery um, and uh, and then we'll we'll go on to talk about a little bit about near term uh, nearer term quantum computing. So I'm just going to highlight first of all this pipeline which I sort of highlighted already a little bit. It's broken up into multiple different pieces and depending on um, your level of granularity you can see this in different ways but I'm going to talk through each of them um, briefly and just give some of the challenges. So the first one is very much focused on um, understanding the bit of biology in the human body that you wish to target uh, with a drug. From that point onwards you're really identifying potential drug molecules trying to optimize them, make sure they're safe and get them proven uh, in, in, in clinical trials. And you can see how the years add up um, throughout this process, but also how the um, it, it's really a massive funnel where most things that you might consider um, ultimately will not will not make it through um, to a final product. So this uh, this is of course not to scale and does not do justice to the you know the number of things which uh, do not progress uh, in in this industry. So let's give a quick sort of overview of the different uh, of, the, of these, these different areas just to get a sense of some of the challenges. So identifying the targets is really about sort of um, un understanding human biology and some of the challenges there actually mining the literature out there. Um, doing uh, uh, analysis of, uh, of, of data sets. Um, more recently, people have been studying genomic analysis from from very large data sets to try and associate um, particular genes with with diseases and therefore help um, um, create uh, create drug targets for for research and development and indeed there's lots of sort of causal reasoning and understanding on biological networks which entities might be the right things to target to actually have an impact and uh, and, and mitigate disease so that's the first area the second area is identifying some of those compounds which might become the next drug molecule. And this is something which is typically done with very large scale, scale, large scale screening. So huge amounts of robotics, um, huge amounts of automated labs, um, high throughput screening with these sort of micro titer plates and these uh, automated pipettes can, um, can, can process a few million compounds over a, over a period usually of days to weeks. In fact, more recent technologies with DNA tagging of molecules can push those numbers uh, a few orders of, of magnitude higher. And once you've established some compounds which show some level of activity um, against the, the, the bit of biology that you're interested in um, acting on, there's a process of confirming those, establishing the potency by, by exploring different concentrations of, of those compounds and so on. So the kinds of challenges here are everything from optimization of the robotics and the workflow, um, which are challenges in their own right. Optimization in terms of which of these potential um, hits to, to progress uh, through the uh, through the R&D process. And indeed, more recently, um, looking to, to, to in parallel take a virtual approach to this with, 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 with different modeling approaches. So virtual screening is using machine learning and using other simulation techniques, modeling techniques to try and predict on a much bigger set of molecules, which of them might be active and which could be progressed through the, through the drug discovery pipeline. Okay, after this, this is an area where I probably will talk about most in the in the in the next uh, part of the talk. Optimizing those molecules, so finding something which shows some potential um, is the first part of this. But then there are many many properties that have to be uh, optimized in the in the process. So we have repeated cycles of designing something, figuring out how to how to synthesize it, testing it, analyzing the results, modifying, and so on, and repeating this cycle to look at everything from uh, how, um, how potent the drug is, um, whether it is uh, at any risk of um, uh, showing toxicity, um, any number of other off-target effects that, um, that the molecules might show which are not favorable, even for example, how, how, how challenging it may be to, to synthesize at an industrial scale. These are all things that have to factor into this uh, complex uh, decision-making process. And so there are many uh, opportunities for both modeling and, and simulation. So if you can predict certain properties without having to, to do them in the lab, then that's hugely beneficial because it can expand this, the space of um, possibilities which can be considered. 
but you also have this opportunity to cut down the time scales because typically it will be faster. Similarly, sort of simulating um, the activity of a uh, the, the, the behavior of a drug on, uh, actually docking with a protein is is hugely valuable in this area and something which is done routinely. Building models to predict which changes to molecules are likely to lead to higher activity. So this QSAR term you hear is quantitative structure activity relationship, and it's all about finding those properties um, which improve the uh, improve the uh, activity of the drug. Uh, generative models is a new area using machine learning to, to, to actually create molecules from scratch, which are likely to have the right properties. It's an area which has started to get um, some visibility in, in, in the sort of quantum machine learning space as well, and we may mention it briefly at the end. Um, and finally, sort of optimizing which compounds to synthesize and test. This is something we will discuss in more detail because it's a really complex uh, landscape of uh, a situation where there are far many more things that you could possibly um, um, study and make in the lab, then you have the resources to do and prioritizing those 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 um, those decisions is 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 very, very challenging and important. OK, final couple of uh, areas I'll discuss more quickly um, because we may only give a brief, uh, a more brief mention later. But after this, we move into the preclinical phases. This is frequently um, testing on animal models. And really, the main aim is uh, is, is assessing whether whether the, um, uh, the the drug is safe. So this involves sort of dynamic um, modeling of the way in which the drug um, is is, uh, is absorbed, metabolized, and the impact that it has in terms of human uh, biology. Um, how that how that um, how that can be described affects obviously dosing schedules and so on. And that's all important to establish. As well as that kind of um, that kind of dynamic modeling, there are other sort of challenges in in automating image analysis of samples. So typically, you generate large numbers of pathology samples, being able to get you know understand those quickly at scale is 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 a is another challenge we might we might return to finally clinical trials and this is where there's a huge amount of cost and there's a huge amount of expense and again there's a huge amount of optimization to be done so the real aim of this lengthy and costly process is to understand does it work is it efficacious and is it safe um, and the optimization challenges span from how to design a trial in the best way in terms of when patients will visit the clinic, what measurements you take. Um, for example, to minimize the burden on the patients, it's important that um, when running a trial, the patients get a benefit and um, their their experience is, um, is as good as possible. Um, also, that ensures getting the best possible data from the trial. Alongside that, optimizing where you're going to run the trial is really important to make sure you get the cross section of data that's needed, but also, um, you know, capture um, capture the data in a timely fashion. Uh, similarly, there you see supply chain getting getting the right pharmaceuticals to the right um, to the right people at the right time, which is incredibly important because usually supply chain and for placebo is easy, but um, for for a, for, a, for a potential drug candidate is a little bit harder. Um, and if the supply chain of one of those is interrupted, then it could lead uh, clinicians and phys and patients to understand whether they're in the placebo or uh, um, or, or, or the, uh, the the drug arm of a clinical trial, which would would make it invalid. Um, and finally, sort of modeling which patients will actually benefit. There's a lot of work in sort of modeling um, who who would benefit from a therapeutic because it's far better to um, to to have to to come up with a new a new product that will benefit some people really well and understand who those uh, people are than to try and give it to everybody and and recognize that it works some of the time. So that really is just a a whirlwind tour through some of the challenges in this uh, industry for for those of you who who may not know quite so much uh, uh, about it. From this point onwards. I'd like us to move and talk a little bit about some of the uh, the opportunities for quantum computing. And I'll share some of the things which we have uh, we, we are starting to work on. Um, our, to be completely honest, we are um, towards the start of our journey in 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 this area in this particular domain. Um, so these are not all um, all complete stories yet. But I will also supplement that with some of the uh, some description of some of the other recent works which have been published by others in these areas. Um, and um, and then and then we'll give a a, a brief overview of, um, uh, of of other topics that we haven't haven't covered. So 
First of all, I'm just going to touch on, a, I, I guess, um, uh, an area which I know Julian has already covered, but I'm going to just to say it in my own words, uh, in, a, in a way that um, provides the necessary ingredients for the uh, for the subsequent um, slides on variational methods um, in quantum computing. So I think you know, we, we can see a quantum computer as um, uh, a, a set of two state subsystems where we can uh, control the uh, the evolution the unitary evolution uh, in, a, in a parameterized way with a high degree of control we can make measurements and we can draw inferences from from those particular measurements and in this in this near term uh, era of, of noisy intermediate scale computers well the, the number of qubits is of course limited and the depth of the circuit is for all of the reasons which uh, Ju Julian was talking about, the, the, the fidelities, decoherence, um, and so on. So variational methods are, 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 are one of the areas which are particularly relevant in the NISC era because there are some problems where it's, it, it's, it's, it's widely believed that uh, useful insights can be drawn from circuits which are not too deep, um, but at the expense of running those circuits large numbers of times. So doing this unitary evolution with some kind of parameterized um, unitary and, and, and then um, um, finding the expectation of, of particular projection operators, potentially um, of, 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 of strings of Pauli operators, which we can repeat multiple, multiple times and, and then infer expectation values. OK, so with that in mind as a sort of um, the, the sort of background level here to start talking about um, some of these uh, some of these applications, I wanted to introduce a couple of kinds of problems which broadly fall into the same um, same class of solutions. So problems which involve finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of, of symmetric or, or, or indeed Hermitian matrices. And we're going to talk about one of these first, the, uh, the, the, the one involving these sorts of objects on the left hand side, and then we'll move on to the right hand side, which is rather more focused on, on, on optimization. So if we start on the left hand side, we're going to be looking here at uh, eigenvalues, which actually represent uh, uh, energies in um, in, in physical systems such as such as in quantum chemistry and indeed the eigenvectors are going to be the um, uh, the, the 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 elements of um, of, uh, of states in a particular basis which we use for for a calculation like this in quantum chemistry we'll, we'll discuss that in more detail soon on the other side it may be that we have another class of problem where we are actually describing um, uh, a combinatorial optimization in this case, this is a sort of classic uh, problem. Uh, you, you, you can um, search this easily. The, the knapsack problem where, for example, we want to select which items to put in the bag in such a way that we maximize the value, um, but, but minimize, the, uh, minimize the weight of, of, of what's contained in the bag. So the, the, an eigenvalue of interest might be the, the, the sort of um, um, minus the, the, the sort of optimum value in the bag. Um, and indeed, uh, an eigenvector is associated with that might capture which elements we've 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 actually put in the bag. So the the optimal configuration associated with that uh, with that kind of challenge. Now, one of the ways which this can be done um, using using variable uh, variational approaches is taking advantage of the uh, variational principle. The idea that um, if we have a um, a, a, a emission operator like this. Um, and we want to find, uh, we want to optimize to find it's the, the lowest eigenvalue, what we can do is we can look at the normalized expectation value over some states, which we parameterize, and we're, we're guaranteed that um, for, for any particular state, this uh, expectation value will be um, no smaller than the uh, than the minimum eigenvalue. So what we do is we find a way of parameterizing these states such that we can vary those parameters um, in an iterative fashion such that we can um, minimize the value of this this entity here um, and thus get closer and closer to this uh, to this um, to this lowest eigenvalue which of course in the context of uh, a, a, a physical Hamiltonian um, will of course be the ground the ground state um, energy so this lends itself to a set of problems um, in, qu in quantum computing where the, the Hilbert space dimension is fairly large um, 
so it'd be difficult um, to, to capture those, um, to, to estimate those expectation values um, uh, exactly on a, on a classical computer. But one of the things that we will need to rely on, um, as you'll see when we discuss this in more detail, is that it is possible to find a parameterization of this state um, and indeed um, um, optimize that in a, in a, in a reasonable time um, over, over a set of parameters so that we do get close to, um, to an optimum which is, which is useful. So let's talk a little bit about how that actually works. So our first challenge is to actually map our problem to qubits, and I'll say a few words about that um, in some of the specific examples um, coming up. But essentially, we need to be able to write the Hamiltonian in terms of, uh, you know, a, a sum over over products of, of, of Pauli operators. And the second ingredient is that we, of course, need to be able to identify an ansatz for this, this prior parameterization. So we need to be able to identify um, a, a functional form of, 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 of how we um, are going to create a, a set of wave functions parameterized by, uh, by a set of parameters theta, such that we can modify those, um, those values theta and, um, uh, and ultimately explore that space. Now the next step is actually where we use the quantum computer. We can prepare this state, um, this state um, uh, parameterized by a particular value of uh, of all of these um, um, parameters theta, using using a set of custom unitaries made up made up of gates. Then can estimate uh, expectation value of uh, as shown here from from measurements, and our next step is to Consider the next set of um, the next set of parameters which we're going to tr select to try and improve um, the, the 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 minimization of this of this expectation value. And when we do that, we feed this back into the quantum computer with 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 updated yeah, with updated unitary evolution, and we can keep keep doing this multiple multiple times. And the idea here is that this is actually a, a, a kind of hybrid algorithm because some of the com computation is done on the quantum computer. Some of it's done classically with um, somewhat conventional uh, optimization techniques here. So you can see now why it's important that actually the dimension of this parameterization should be not too high, but it has to be a parameterization which ultimately will take us um, take us to states which are which are useful for this optimization problem. OK, so this is kind of the the, the, the background of how this general class of problems work, I'd like to talk a little bit about a specific example, um, which is that of molecular simulation, um, and just sketch out how that works um, at a high level. So the next sort of two, three slides have a few equations on. Those are for those of you who know this area well, just so that if you're not familiar with this area, you can kind of see how we get from a generic um, molecular or condensed matter Hamiltonian to something which we can um, use with VQE on a, on a quantum computer. Um, if, if, if all of these sort of equations don't mean anything, then don't, don't worry. I'll try and explain with words as we go. This is just to sort of sketch out um, where, we're, where we're going. I should say, actually, the person in the, the group who's starting to look at this area and uh, take this on as, as his area of study uh, is actually Francis Newson. So I'm really presenting um, the area that he, he is working on uh, currently. OK, so let's start with a general Hamiltonian. This is for um, um, a description of, of, of electrons and ions, and at this point it could be a fairly general condensed matter Hamiltonian or could, could refer to quantum chemistry. There, there are no external fields or anything here, but uh, if I just go through the terms briefly, I will say these are this is the kinetic, kinetic energy of the ions, this is the kinetic energy of the electrons, these are the, uh, the, this is the Coulomb interaction between the, um, the ions and the electrons, these are the electron and electron interactions, and these are the ion ion interactions again. Uh, due to the Coulomb interaction. Now, the first thing that we would do is try and turn this into purely um, a, a, a electronic structure problem um, by freezing the ions. So we'll make the Born Oppenheimer approximation, and that means we get rid of ter two terms straight away. So uh, if the ions are frozen, well, this 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 term on the right hand side is, is is essentially constant, and we remove the kinetic energy of the ions as well. And we have three terms to deal with. 
Now it turns out that for um, for chemistry, there are some pretty standard uh, approaches to get um, uh, approximate solutions to, 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 to this sort of equation. And we're going to need some of these if we're going to apply a quantum computer to this challenge using VQE. So what we really need to do is come up with a basis which is which is good um, and forms a good starting point for us to, uh, to start to do some, some calculations. So let's talk just briefly about how we do that. Um, the way we do that is through um, through Hartree-Fock theory, or at least this is a, a, a very standard approach to do this. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the the details of how this works. Many of you, I'm sure, will have um, studied this at previous points, but I just want to remind you of kind of some of the key ingredients and and what it gives us by by taking an approximate uh, an approximate approach to um, to a challenge like this. Really, the Hartree-Fock uh, approximation uh, starts by creating um, Slater determinants of of of, of, um, of of single particle orbitals, often uh, atomic orbitals or some other um, basis set, and in doing this, it's effectively creating a mean field uh, approach to this Hamiltonian. So, what do I mean by all of that that I've just said? Well, effectively, what I mean is that rather than having um, a many electron Hamiltonian where the electrons all inter interact with each other, we have an effective Hamiltonian where um, we have just single particles um, and each electron um, in that single particle effective Hamiltonian feels uh, the an average an average potential from all of the uh, other electrons. Now, this does uh, actually capture the uh, exchange interaction, so we we are able to capture the sort of fermionic um, uh, statistics, the, uh, the the effects of the Pauli principle by doing this. But what we definitely cannot capture are um, electron electron correlation effects because we have quite explicitly um, removed them uh, removed them from the process. And in fact, we've done something else by by going to an effective mean field description. Um, we, re we replace a, a, a many electron Hamiltonian with, a, with, a, with an effective single particle description, but it's become um, highly non-linear because this this uh, average uh, effect of all of the other electrons depends on the solutions for all of the other uh, all of the other electron states so this is something that we actually have to solve self consistently such that we find a way in which we have solutions where we we update uh, the solutions to to modify the uh, the, the the orbitals um, in 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 such a way that um, in in such a way that this sort of a, a effective potential is is encountered for but after several pages of um, after several pages of algebra, what we end up with the, uh, at the end is a set of molecular orbitals which are approximate because, as I've said, electron correlations are neglected, but they form a good basis for us to use, um, and and we can use that in in future calculations. We can indeed write this in terms of a, a second quantized Hamiltonian of this uh, incredibly standard form of a in interacting Hamiltonian where these um, um, these constants here come from those uh, those um, integrals over over the over the basis states essentially. So they're, they're just numbers that we can we can evaluate numerically. OK, so we that that was just a sort of bit of a sort of uh, technical um, summary of how we progress from a from a sort of starting description to something which we can get onto a quantum computer. We're almost there. Um, obviously, the, these fermionic uh, operators um, don't don't map uh, directly to um, to qubits on a quantum computer, but we have standard transformations to deal with that. For example, the Jordan Wigner transformation, and then we we can we can come up with a, a qubit Hamiltonian, which is um, in exactly the form that we would we would like. And so. Final ingredient that we need is just we need an ins an ansatz of the, the the form of the of the of the of the, of the quantum state with with a set of parameters described by theta. There are many many different um, different ways of doing this. Um, I'm just going to mention one here, um, which is to be inspired by uh, some standard. Um, uh, solutions in, uh, in in quantum chemistry. Uh, this this here is a unitary um, couple cluster with with singles and doubles, and you can kind of see what it does. It takes a form which is necessarily unitary in nature, um, and then um, 
provides an expansion over um, single particle and double particle um, mixing terms which which take um which take electrons from occupied uh, orbitals in the hartree fock basis and put them into some of the un unoccupied orbitals and so it kind of makes sense that what we're doing here is we're starting to mix some of the occupied and unoccupied orbitals in such a way that we get a, a you know a, a, a better solution to the to the true ground state for the uh, for the molecule so this is really inspired by understanding the um uh, understanding the physical problem and the uh, the parameters here are the theta parameters are essentially these constants here which are the things that we we would optimize over now this is one of many choices there are other um ansatzes which are based on um uh, based on hardware optimization so there's a whole range of um uh, of solutions which include um taking ansatzes which can be easily implemented um in in the space of qubits and using those for a um for a parameterized um sort of set of states which can be explored by vqe um so full full range here i'm just going to give an example um which which came from the, the the literature so this is the the first i believe the first example actually um which is sort of non-trivial in the sense that it includes elements beyond period period one of the the periodic table so moving between beyond sort of 1s electrons um, this is from ibm studying um uh, hydrogen lithium hydride and uh, beryllium dihydride and what you see here is that um they are they are showing the um showing three things on these plots they're showing the um um the, the the binding energy as a as a function of the the separation between the uh, between the atoms in these small molecules um and the the dots are actual experiments on a on a on on their quantum computer the um the sort of density shaded regions are are showing the outcome of of simulations of um of of, of that process and then the the sort of dotted line is actually the exact diagonalization solution so you'll see here that actually the um the, these experiments don't agree exactly with um with the exact exact diagonalization of the the exact numer numerical diagonalization of the hamiltonian um but this is something which they can account for with the sort of finite surf uh, the finite circuit depth and, and and so on um within the ansatz uh, that they're using here now these are obviously very small molecules. These are not drug-like molecules, um, but there's a nice example um, of um, uh, of some work which was published just a few months back. I think around September. Sorry, um, appeared as a manuscript a, a few months back. Um, this is actually a collaboration between Rush and CQC, which tried to map out the sort of end-to-end -end workflow of how you apply VQE on mole molecules. To um, to explore the binding of, um, of 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 molecules to proteins. Now, to do this, they have to make a few approximations because we are obviously still at small scales with the technology. The first thing they do is that the uh, the protein is actually considered to be frozen, so that it just provides um, a, a fixed potential for the for the molecule. So we're not you know not not considering the electronic structure of the protein. Um, uh, in in the calculation, and that means that the binding energy is calculated as the difference between the uh, the the energy of the um, of of the ligand or or, or molecule uh, uh, it, when it when it's actually bound to the protein mi minus the uh, the ligand when it's in aqueous solvent. So that difference is what tells us uh, how strongly um, uh, a, a molecule will bind. And they took a series of um, a, a, of known molecules. Um, against a particular biological target that was well understood, a protein that was well understood. And to apply VQE to this, um, they had to break the molecule up into fragments. So in an ideal world, they would have studied uh, this entire molecule with VQE, but the the, the size of drug molecules is, is simply too large for that. So they used an approach called um, density matrix embedding theory, which enables you to um, to, to study the uh, the molecule in a self-consistent way, um, but where you are actually studying each of these fragments in terms of its reduced density matrix over the entire molecule. And so in this case, they actually study the the, the blue region um, on a quantum computer with VQE, and the other regions are are only um, uh, are are only studied to the Hartree-Fock um, level of approximation. Now the reason that this blue region is the bit which was studied. Um, on a quantum computer, where they're hoping to capture um, 
full um, electron correlation effects is that this is the part which is actually known to, to, to bind um, to the protein of interest. So they've picked the, uh, the, the part of the molecule which docks to, uh, to study in greater detail. And what they wanted to do is see, would this work as a workflow for prioritizing compounds, for ranking them in terms of those which are most favorable for, um, for, um, for progression through the R&D pipeline? And the answer is that uh, this is something they are able to recover. Um, so on the y-axis here is this is is this binding energy is sort of defined on the top left. Um, on on the x-axis um, is essentially a measure of the uh, the concentration needed to, uh, to 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 inhibit this protein. So if you like, the the x-axis is a measure of the potency of the uh, of the potential drug compound. And as you move to the right, um, you have molecules which are more potent. As you move from top to bottom, you've got those which are predicted to be stronger binders. And there's a very good relationship here. So this is a really really nice study to see. Um, not because it produces something at a scale which is uh, which is not possible with classical techniques, far far from it, but because it sort of treats the problem end to end and explores how this might um, might work in the in the real commercial world. Okay, I'd like to switch gear if I may for the last part of the talk and I move to talk about some optimization challenges. Um, so this is uh, this is some work which another member of the team has been working on, Scott uh, Leidenheim. Um, and optimization challenges, as I mentioned in the start, have some interesting applications in uh, within within drug discovery. Um, I'm going to talk about one in great detail, which Scott's been looking at. But before I do, I just want to sort of flag up a general class of uh, problems, which are those uh, known as quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problems. Those look like something like this. They're quadratic and the variables here are, are, are binary and the aim is to find um, the configuration of these binary variables so that we minimize this, this overall cost function. And I think at, at this point, um, given the earlier discussion, it's no surprise that this is essentially something that we can tackle with, um, with VQE techniques by, by recognizing um, we just need a, 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 you know, an effective an effective Hamiltonian. Now there are a few differences here from uh, the case of quantum simulation uh, and in particular actually this is this is a diagonal problem this is this is a this is to some extent a classical problem and you, therefore you might think well why is there any point in uh, approaching this with quantum techniques and the answer is to that, that while it is um, diagonal in the computational basis um, it has an extremely large number of eigenvalues. So it's very, very large. And in fact, just capturing all of those configurations rapidly becomes impossible as you go to bigger and bigger, bigger systems. So um, for exactly the same reason, capturing those expectation values in VQE um, on, a, on a quantum computer is, um, is, is potentially valuable because of the fact that um, we can uh, study a system with two to the n configurations with with n qubits and in fact this property allows a rather general ansatz called the uh, quantum approximate optimization ansatz i won't go into too much detail in this now because there's actually not not quite so much time but it's it's another gen general form with some parameters that can be learned through the through the 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 the, the, the same vqe process i want to actually talk a little bit about a, a particular example the one that scott's um working on because I think it's a little bit interesting and that is around this challenge of lead optimization. So frequently um, in this uh, area um, the, the scientists find themselves in a situation where they have a whole range of um, different um, d different variations on molecules that they'd like to make but they can't make all of them and they need to prioritize what they make in order to get as much insight as possible. So in this case, we've got two sort of positions, R1 and R2, which um, can be filled by any number of fragments. So these are some examples of fragments of molecule that can be um, uh, attached at this point R2. And these are some from R1. And actually, these are only a subset um, in this particular example, which comes from a paper we've worked on with a, with a client many, many, many years ago. Um, the, the total space is around 2,500 compounds, and that is uh, probably a couple of orders of magnitude more than would would, would be done within a sort of a, a normal single experimental cycle at, at this phase of drug discovery. Um, so what's typically done is that a set of compounds is selected, 
those are synthesized. That's not always possible. These are generally new molecules, but, but the medicinal chemists go away and try and do that. They're tested in biochemical assays. The results are analyzed and, and we repeat this kind of process. Now, when we sort of say subset selection, the, the key point is what, what things do we want to look at when selecting such compounds? Well, here's a list of things that we might like to do. In general, we don't want to select two compounds early on, which are very similar because they're quite likely to have similar activities. So if you imagine this is a cartoon of chemical space on the right hand side here, if we select um, the dark blue dots to make us, the, these, if these represent compounds that we're going to make in experiments, we don't really want to also make the light blue dots because, for example, in this case, these two are likely to be very similar and we won't learn very much more from, from, the, from, from making something which is very similar to something that we've already tested. Now, we might also want to sort of have a control over the number of compounds. We might also want to favour selecting compounds which are predicted to be more, um, to be more active. And we'll come on to that. We might also favor compounds which are predicted to have good other off target properties. So, you know, have predicted to not be a, a risk for toxicity, predicted to be easy to synthesize at an industrial scale, and so on. And it turns out that all of these sort of penalties can be captured by diagonal and off diagonal terms within that um, within that cubo form, which I showed at the at the beginning. So we can tackle these with this kind of generic optimization problem. And where we are so far is we've shown this works with toy problems and we're moving on to real data, but this is kind of how the workflow um, works. You start by um, running the optimization algorithm to get a diverse set of compounds. You make them, you test them in an assay, and then you can train a predictive model that uh, is going to learn which other compounds are likely to be more active. And then you can return to your optimization problem and add some, ter add some other um, terms to the cubo, which also push the optimization towards selecting compounds which are not only diverse but also more likely to be active and you can keep doing this and as you keep doing this you move from um, exploring the space of uh, potential molecules to actually exploiting what you've learned about them through your series of experiments and actually homing in on the on the on the best molecules so as I say this will be move we'll be moving to to real data that looks like this and this is actually a full matrix of, um, of uh, in this case where we have two different fragments that could be could be um, could be um, uh, could could be um, could be substituted into the molecule um, and you can see that this does show a lot of structure as we expect because similar similar structures do have indeed similar activities in the last few minutes I thought we'd just move slightly to talk about some of the other opportunities for optimization I think given the time, I'll try and cover these quite quickly just to sort of give you a flavour of some of the things which uh, we think are potentially interesting um, um, b b before coming to a close uh, for, uh, for uh, at half past the hour. So to, to move on to one other, um, one other area I just want to give a, a one side overview of. Um, this is a this is an application which finds benefit in the clinical space uh, and, and potentially in many other uh, areas as well and indeed many other industries and that's the area of interpretable machine learning models. Uh, it particularly applies to clinical um, contexts because in that context it's really important that we have models which are high in accuracy but are also interpretable so physicians and clinicians doctors can actually understand what a model is doing and why it's coming up with particular predictions so that it can be used so the sorts of models I'm talking about are for example prognostic models, diagnostic models, um, models which may be used to actually recommend a therapy for a particular patient given data on that patient and that kind of data can sometimes be very high dimensional so a little bit like in the cartoon on the right hand side here it may include um, multiple model input features, um, you know, which, which sort of span, um, you know, for example, with 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 blood samples, panels of biomarkers, which which could sort of be in the sort of hundreds, um, and that's going to be very very hard to interpret. So our aim is to get a sort of subset of these inputs. Um, such that we still have a good model, um, but it's easy to understand. And that means we need to include these these features which are relevant, um, but, but have low redundancy. And what do I mean by redundancy? Well, to select relevance or redundancy, we can use any number of statistics 
for example, the correlation between that feature and the output, or the correlation between two of those features, or indeed the, the mutual information as I put here, these are all measures that enable us to do that. This is an example of a matrix for um, for a uh, for, for, for mutual information for, for some real data, and I've just put on two examples here of subsets. This one in the bottom left has low redundancy because actually there's little information shared between those those different features. Uh, this one higher up on the right would have, for example, high redundancy because there's there's shared information between the features which we've we've captured. So we want we, we favour the the left hand the bottom left example. But also in such a way that the, the you know each of those features has relevant to the relevance to the thing that we're trying to predict. And of course, I can pick any subset of these. The the number of sub the, the size of uh, the the number of possible subsets grows uh, exponentially with uh, you know with the, the the size of the problem with the number of features. Well, this it turns out actually lends itself to um, to an optimization of the cubo form. Um, where we um, where we favor selecting uh, features which um, which um, which contain information about the thing that we're trying to predict, but we penalize the selection of multiple features which contain the same information as as each other. And indeed, we can vary the relative weights of those to, to determine how many features we'd like to keep. So that's just a quick view of one one other area that's relevant. Um, other people have looked at similar optimization techniques. This is a, a, a paper from earlier last year um, on, on protein structure optimization. So um, from, from the IBM team, putting um, putting amino acids on a, on a lattice and optimizing how those um, how those um, sequences of amino acids uh, fold to to come up with uh, the, to, to identify the, um, the the protein structures. Now at the moment we're at length of sort of ten amino acids, so not extremely um, not extremely large, um, but but it's a demonstration of the kinds of um, things which could be could be potentially valuable in future. And finally, I've listed a few other areas here as other things that I think are interesting. Um, I won't go in great detail because of the uh, time that we have left, but this spans everything from optimization of um, the sequences of RMA, our mRNA, which is very topical with um, with recent vaccine technologies. There are many different sequences in uh, mRNA which lead to the same protein, but they're not all equal. And if you change the sequence in one place, it has consequences elsewhere. So this is actually a, a, a complex optimization problem. Similarly, we've seen our mRNA folding. Um, the sorts of a routine sort of operational optimization um, problems um, necessarily sort of have, have universal interest. And indeed, we're starting to see some, some exploration of QML in the drug discovery space as well, both in terms of Things like generation of novel molecules, which is an area I've worked on a lot, um, but but not 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 in the quantum machine learning context. There's a there's a hope that actually better representations are are could, could be learnt with with quantum machine learning techniques here. And this 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 paper gives a sketch of that. Uh, again, people have started to look at, uh, at imaging examples and, and and medical imaging, for example, um, as is used in in preclinical studies is uh, is an application there. So I'm aware that I'm kind of really coming to the end of uh, the, the time that we had allocated. So I will try and quickly uh, summarize um, uh, th th this talk. I think hopefully um, I've managed to convey uh, uh, some enthusiasm for the potential of quantum computing in uh, in, in life sciences. Indeed, many other organisations are already exploring these uh, these opportunities. So it is, um, I think, widely considered to be an industry where where the the technology will become relevant across years ahead. Many of the nearer term algorithms that I've um, dis described here, really the sort of variational uh, algorithms do rely on um, heuristics and that means the advantage is uncertain. It's somewhat um, uh, likely to be problem uh, dependent and we really need to reach uh, larger scales to explore them in detail. But I guess the good news is that the, the rapid rate of hardware development means that we, we, we don't necessarily have to wait too long for that to, to happen to be able to explore this um, in future. So with that, I'll I'll come to a close and, and thank you all for your attention. Many thanks for the talk. So the session is open for questions. Uh, please click on the raise hand button if you have any questions.
if there are any questions now, don't worry. Feel free to email any questions across to us. Uh, that is. Yes. Um, actually, we can go ahead with the question. Uh, hi, sir. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the parameter updation step in the VQ algorithm. Uh, I think it wasn't clear how exactly the parameters are updated after the energy expectation has been measured. Uh, uh, sorry, do you mean if we go back here? Um, uh, at this point here? Yeah. Yes. Um, OK, this, it's a very good it's a very good question. Um, and I think my cartoon here um, is is a is, is perhaps a little bit oversimplified, actually. And you're 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 right to point me point this out here. So it, it depends on actually what the what, what the Hamiltonian is uh, in terms of um, in, in terms of strings of Pauli operators um, um, that, that make up the Hamiltonian. So in general, we have a sort of sequence, uh, a, a sum over non-commuting terms in the Hamiltonian. Um, we would have to sort of um, uh, estimate each of those separately. Um, and in general, in some cases, because these will not all be in the computational basis, we'll have to apply some uh, some, some rotations to the qubits first and then and then pull those into that that particular you know, in, into the right basis to take the measurement. So it will depend on the specifics of the um, of, of, of the model which is being uh, studied. OK, thank you, sir. So now one another gen very general question like at the in the last slide, you mentioned some of the research papers uh, about these uh, studies. And so there were first two ones. One was optimization of codon sequences and the optimization of mRNA folding. Now, like this, yes. these two applications, like they are, um, they are a part of even many genome editing studies and genome uh, genetic medicines. So I just want to know, are there any studies that like try to find, like map these quantum applications or quantum models to such studies as well? say in cancer drug therapies where there are a lot of targets and uh, there are like a lot of potential um, uh, gene targets available? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so I'm trying to think off the top of my head what I've what I've seen. So it's, it's I'll, I'll be completely honest, it's not an area that I have worked on. We have worked on directly um, ourselves. Um, you're absolutely right that it's an area that comes up as a topic of, um, you know, kind of a discussion as an application, but I can't think of a particular good reference that's gone end to end in 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 that um, in that space. I'll, I'll come back. I, I can sort of come back to you if I um, if I chance across across one because I almost certainly have actually got some, but I can't think of one immediately. The reason I should say that I picked out these were because um, I, I thought they were quite nice examples of papers for, that, that actually take the problem end to end and they really explore it as a, as a kind of real you know kind of real example I mean the code on sequencing one is so so incredibly topical but they also think about the scales on which is you know which is relevant today so actually um, I think there's a claim that um, you know kind of looking at sequences even of up to length 30 would 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 be useful um, you know in 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 the real world so that sort of sets a point at which you know if you get to this uh, th this stage then it's sort of genuinely genuinely valuable sure so thank you for sharing these virtual reports with them yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Professor Apurva, please. Yeah, you described uh, optimization problems, which uh, can be written in terms of some Hamiltonian uh, energy minimization, but there are dynamical problems also. For example, determination of reaction pathways in many yeah. enzymes and uh, uh, catalytic uh, reactions. So what are the kind of strategies used to formulate those problems? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so you're, you're right, there are there are more um, there are certainly more challenging problems than the, the ones which have been highlighted here. Um, I think it's also worth saying that um, there are more general um, 
Um, I, what, what I've shown here is not perhaps the most general class of problems which could be tackled with 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 gate based approaches. Um, so some of those other areas do introduce um, you know do do introduce other complex complexities, um, and I'm aware people are studying them. I should say the reason that in here kind of we we focused on these ones is because um, really for us kind of the we were keen to look at the things which are possibly the sort of nearest term in terms of the technology, which means sort of super suitably sort of simple um, um, that the, the, the they map relatively easily while also actually having value um, in, in, in the real world. And I think if there is, for example, a you know, an advantage in the uh, in the case of the, um, uh, you know, for example, in the sort of lab optimization, which things do you make? That would be relatively near a term. And actually, if you move towards a sort of simulation, uh, even though I think it's likely that we'll, we'll see some, um, you know, some some examples where that can be done on real, you know, on scales which are relevant for real molecules. I think actually doing it on examples which are relevant for the for the pharmaceutical industry are perhaps a step even further beyond that, because actually the sort of simpler cases can already be ta tackled quite well with with approximate um, with approximate techniques. So. I realize it's sort of a bit of a general answer, but I think it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a journey to sort of adding that complexity in and finding, you know, which, which things to go after. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Professor Shah. Um, thank you for the good talk. So I think in in this um, interesting application, I think the key choice is the Hamiltonian, the state preparation, right? I mean, that's the key step, yeah. the state preparation problem. So how do we, you know, how how does one proceed with 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 what sort of intuition? Uh, in, in the, because that I I feel that's a critical step with the state preparation and and the choice of the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, among many okay. possibilities, because that lends itself to the to the optimization post that. So, what is your feel on this? Uh, well, there, there seem to be sort of. I mean, there there are multiple. I, I was sort of explaining that that the, the give sort of lecture series on the sort of. Um, the, the sort of techniques and how they sort of have been developed to 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 um to, to use more sophisticated um approaches both in terms of the ansatz and the the optimization technique that you use and how those indeed can 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 be adaptive and 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 relate to 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 each other as uh, as a sort of problem progresses to to give a general comment though i think there are kind of two two clear categories, ones which are sort of physically motivated by an understanding of the problem, and then those which sort of lend themselves to easy, um, uh, you know, re relatively easy implementation on a quantum computer, but where the interpretation of, of, of why you've sort of chosen that particular parameterization is is not so clear. My, my guess would be that as as the technology progresses, actually, we might see sort of greater insight from the um, from the former um, because actually it'll become easier to um, to explore some of those more physically motivated forms for the the the, the preparation of uh, of of the states but that's purely um that, that's purely speculation on my part i think alongside that as you say there's the, the sort of um how to sort of set up the problem and uh I think the key thing is that it does depend on this intuition that, that you have about the problem. And I think in some situations it's sort of clear um, what you can do with physical problems. So, for example, people have studied condensed matter problems, you know, standard um, uh, cases like Ising models, which are sort of well, you know, well, well, well behaved, should we say, away from phase transitions, but as expected, um, you know, you move to critical points and the, um, you know, circuit depths needed sort of grow with the um, grow with the size of the system and that sort of obviously has a ha has an impact on the insight on, on the sort of um, the, the parameterizations that you can use to sort of come up with those to come up with those states. I guess what's sort of interesting to me is in some of these other um, optimization problems where maybe that intuition isn't there what do you do how do you systematically tackle that in such a way that you uh, you find the best possible way of setting yeah. up the problem and i think that's an ongoing that's an ongoing challenge i believe thank you any other questions yes ask please go ahead i think 
So, uh, so can you actually go to that slide where you have the cartoon of optimization? Yes. Uh, Uh, I think yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, right, uh, like here you have written that we optimize using a classical computer. Like why can't we do same calculations on a quantum computer? Like, we can simulate those things also. Why do we need specifically a classical computer? Yeah, that's that, that's a very good point. I mean, I guess in in principle one can. I I, I suppose um um I, I suppose the answer I'd give from um from the sort of perspective of someone who spent a lot of a lot of years in machine learning and and, and neural network research is that actually this kind of uh, this kind of challenge is is something that we have very good heuristics for classically. So sort of um, techniques around, for example, stochastic gradient descent and and related um, you know kind of re related optimization techniques, um, um, which are typically used in neural network training, have been developed over many years. Um, and and they're good at they they they're good at optimizing some of these sorts of challenges. So I think that's why, um, in in a way, we're sort of choosing to 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 do the sort of lower dimensional part where, where we where we have good algorithms already. But you're absolutely right. In in principle, there's um, you know, this, this is I think absolutely a kind of a, a bridging class of um, a, a, a bridging class of algorithms which uh, is thought um, could be valuable in the in the nearer term on these in in the NISC era um, and, and 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 things may be different in future. <clears throat> I hope um, the questions are done. Uh, if so, please join me in thanking Dr. Sam. And thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, and please pass on our thanks to Julian. I don't know if he's still there. Um, yeah, well, Dr. Thank Apurva, you. can I hope you can close the session? Um, well, uh, we'll like to thank um, Jamini very much for these interesting uh, lectures from Dr. Sam and uh, Dr. Julian. And uh, it gave our students some idea about what are the problems that are considered interesting from the point of view of industry. And uh, hopefully they will uh, get interested in picking up internships for your company in the coming uh, summer vacation and uh, that will be very useful for both of us I mean, for our teaching as well as uh, your uh, company's interest and we will uh, remain in touch with you from this uh, perspective thank you very much thank you and thank you for the kind invitation to to be here today